we're ready for Ruth chapters 1 and 2 in our study tonight. Last week, uh, as I was out in a gospel meeting, uh, Micah ended up the book of Judges with you. And the book of Ruth fits in this time period according to chapter 1 and verse 1. And that's why it appears here in our English Bible uh, as it appears in this English text. Now for the uh, Jewish Bible, it appeared later and not at this juncture. That's not a matter of of inspiration or non-inspiration. It's just a matter of the grouping and canonization order, at least the order of the canon. And just that's a bit of trivia. You haven't been edified yet, I don't think, from all of that information. So anyway, let's look at Ruth 1 and 2, and chapters 3 and 4 will be next week, and then that'll wind up um, this trimester, and then we're ready to roll into uh, more studies next time. Let's look at some introductory themes, as we do with every book. I think it's appropriate that we look at at least a brief introduction to the book, otherwise the book doesn't have much meaning to us just to start reading without understanding something of what is really the purpose, what's the point, do we know anything about the author, do we know anything about the time period, do we know anything about what's trying to be accomplished. So here's a little brief introduction to that. What is the purpose of the book? Well, uh, if you get a dozen commentaries and read all of those, you'll walk away with about five or six different views of the purpose of the book. Uh, If you get a hold of a modernist who denies the inspiration of the text, some will argue that the purpose of the book is to um, offset the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, that these were two different writers uh, who had different views of marrying Gentiles, and where Ezra and Nehemiah were trying to argue that it was wrong to marry a Gentile, that the book of Ruth is arguing that it's right to marry a Gentile, so here are two different views, and one's trying to offset the other, kind of a... Um, a debate style that denies inspiration of the text another one is that it was just written to be an interesting short story and this is just kind of for entertainment uh, as someone might write a novel for you to read and to be entertained that the author of this book wrote it for the purpose of entertainment that again denies the inspiration of the text um, the purpose seems to be as we get to chapter four as you see on the screen before you to trace the lineage from Perez, Judah's son, to David through Boaz and Obed. And so let's jump over to chapter 4 for a moment, beginning at verse 17. And what you have there is the lineage from Judah all the way to David. So I won't read all of that. I'll let you read that in your own time, and we'll get to that next week. But notice that beginning at verse 17, or in the middle of verse 17, and they called his name Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then it goes back to uh, Perez, or some translations will have Perez, same person, and traces it all the way down to David. And so here is kind of a, this is from Bible manna, uh, starting with Judah uh, here. As you see on the map here, we have Judah and, and Tamar, and here is Perez, or Phares, same person, and then Hezron and Ram and, and on down the line to Salmon, to Boaz, and Ruth have Obed, who is the uh, father of Jesse, who is the father of, of uh, David. Uh, and that indicates these, these crosses represent the lineage of Christ. So going from Judah all the way through David is, is we're seeing the lineage of Christ. And that seems to be the purpose and the point of the book. Now, is there more to be learned? Certainly so. Some argue that the point of the book is uh, to have confidence in the providence of God. Well, I walk away from the book having confidence in the providence of God. Was that the main thrust of the book? I'm not sure that that was the main thrust. I think this probably, as we just mentioned here, uh, and we'll come back to that graph a little bit later in our study next week. But I think the, the, the thrust, in my mind, is as we've listed here is point one, to trace the lineage from Perez, Judah's son, to David through Boaz and Obed. 
And uh, chapter 4 seems to indicate that. So here's kind of the story behind that. It's giving us the story. We could have just had this little lineage mentioned at the beginning of Samuel or at the end of the book of uh, Judges somewhere. And um, But it has more meaning to us in that we know kind of the story behind that. And that's what the book of Ruth does for us. Now, the book also, some have emphasized that they thought the purpose of the book is to emphasize obedience to the Lord. And those who submit to the Lord and those who turn to the Lord are well blessed. Well, I get that from the book and I walk away with learning that. I'm not sure that's the main thrust of the book. So what about the time period? Well, chapter 1, verse 1, let's go back there where we're about to begin. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And so this was in the time of period of the judges. And as we mentioned toward the end of our study, starting about um, from the book of Judges, about chapter 17 on, there's kind of an addendum to the book, and, and here's some things that were not necessarily chronological or, in, or sequential, but they had to do with the time period. And so this book seems to do much the same. Some put this famine of verse 1 as late as Eli, and others put it about the time of, of uh, the uh, Moabite, oppression of chapter 6, uh, and the Amalekite oppression, chapter 6. And so where does it fit? Well, I think any speculation beyond that is going to be a waste of our time. Uh, the text does not say when in the Judges this fits. I want to think because of the ravage of the land. Some uh, suggest, and we may come to this a little bit later, that this may have been this oppression of the Moabites, uh, Some think maybe it was the period of war that's mentioned at the end of the book, uh, which is not necessarily late in the book necessarily, all of it. Uh, But at some point during the period of the Judges, there was this famine. All right, go back to chapter 4 and verse 22 again, just for a cross-reference. It is There is some degree of conjecture here concerning the time. Uh, Now, when we're talking about time, we're talking about two different things. One is... What's the time period that this fits, not when it was written? And then the other question is, when was it written? And so all of that I've put on one line here. It would have been written about the time of David, and there is some conjecture there, at about 1000 B.C. You say, why do you think that, or why do some think that? Because as we trace this lineage, it ends with David and doesn't go on to Solomon. Make sense? It doesn't go any further. Uh, Could it have been written much later than David, and this stopped at David anyway? Sure, but that's why some think it probably had written about the time of David for what that may be worth to us. So who is the author? We don't know. And there's very little speculation about the author, uh, to my knowledge. You may find uh, some commentators that will speculate and say, I think it was, but it's all pure speculation at that. This is one of two books in the Old Testament that's named after a woman. There's the book of Esther and the book of Ruth. An interesting of uh, some similarity and difference. Uh, Esther was a Jew that married a Gentile. Ruth was a Gentile that married a Jew. That's interesting. I'm not sure what you're going to do with that, but uh, that is an interesting uh, little tidbit. Now, the Moabites, uh, Ruth was a Moabitess, the text tells us. Uh, She was from Moab. The people of Moab were descendants of Lot. And we get that from Genesis chapter 19, 30 to 37. So uh, the descendants of Lot were the Moabites. They became uh, pagans and heathens, and they were not uh, among the people of God or considered among the people of God. Some suggest this is a love story that shows love and calm and loyalty in the midst of war and hate. And so as an, an apparently oppressing nation has come, something has caused this famine, uh, and so it's a time of distress, it's a time... Uh, perhaps war, it's a time perhaps of hatred, um, and there's a, it's a time of danger as indicated by Naomi's warnings given to Ruth, and that may suggest that now we do see this love and calm and loyalty in the midst of war and hate. Someone has said, not original with me, that this begins with a funeral and ends with a wedding. And so we, the opening scene, if this were a play, it opens up and a family travels to another country and we have three funerals. And then we have the last scene down here, a wedding. That's interesting for what that may be worth to us. Uh, Questions or comments by way of introduction? 
In case you don't have answers to a couple of the questions, let's go to three, which we just gave. What's the time setting of the book of Ruth? The answer is time of the judges, chapter 1, verse 1. Question number four, who were the Moabites? They were descendants of Lot. To get a bearing as to where they are or where they were located, you have the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, and this region here is the land of Moab. And that's where much of the setting takes place in our uh, story tonight. All right. Um, let's look at an outline of the book. As often I do when I like his material, not sometimes I don't. This time I do, and that is I borrow from Warren Wiersbe his outline of the book. Uh, typical of his style, he uh, uh, makes all of his points of similar wording. And he has chapter 1 as Ruth's sorrow, chapter 2, Ruth's service, chapter 3, Ruth's surrender, chapter 4, Ruth's satisfaction. Now, if you don't get all of that, we're going to get this uh, by next week as we go through. And so here's his point. Now, this is not my outline of chapter 1. I'm going to give you a different one here in a moment. But just kind of follow his line of thought under Ruth's sorrow. Here was Naomi's wrong decision. Here was Naomi's wrong cancel. And here's Naomi's wrong attitude, all in chapter 1. Kind of stretched the first one a little bit, but uh, that's typical also of Wiersbe style. Uh, chapter 2, Ruth's service. God guides Ruth. And then we have Boaz showing kindness to Ruth, and Naomi encourages Ruth. And that's the end of chapter 2. Now, I'm going to skip chapters 3 and 4 and go on to question number 1. Summary of chapter 1. What's chapter 1 about? I am sorry, I'm not hearing. All right, the calamities of Elimelech's family. That's good. Anyone else? It is a tragedy in his family. All right, question. We'll come back to a summary of chapter one. Let's go ahead and get a summary of chapter two. All right, she gathers in the field of Boaz. Good. Anybody else? All right, chapter 1. I like your wording of a summary of chapter 1. I call it simply the stay in Moab and return, but it does deal with this tragedy of Elimelech's family. And so this is uh, the outline that we will follow. This is mine, not Wiersbe's. Uh, but we have three things happen here. Elimelech takes his family to Moab, verses 1 to 5. And then 6 to 18, Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem. And then verses 19 to 22, Naomi and Ruth return uh, to Bethlehem. And so uh, let's start working our way through uh, verses uh, 1 to 5. Now watch for some practical stuff through this. We're going to list some things when we get toward the end of our study um, that may be practical that you learn. It may be something about uh, the right attitude. It may be the wrong attitude. It may be... Um, providence, and maybe how God blesses, about God being a refuge. I'm just trying to give you a hint of some things to watch for as we work through this that you might write down in answer to question number nine. All right, let's go to one to five now. Elimelech takes his family to Moab. So let's work through that. Uh, we've already seen this takes place in the days in which the uh, judges ruled, and some uh, translations will say they are literally, and footnote that will say they literally judged. Um, they weren't rulers in the sense of being kings, though some acted as kings, as we saw uh, a couple of the cases of the judges as we worked through that. Uh, but that's another matter. There was a famine in the land. Now, we've already talked about what may have caused that, perhaps the Moabite or, uh, um, uh, or, or another nation that was mentioned about chapter 6, or it may have been a little bit later, we don't know. But it may have been a, a famine that uh, that was brought on perhaps because of the destruction of the crops, um, some think. And so that may have been caused by an evading, uh, invading enemy. Uh, but there was a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah that went to sojourn in Moab. In other words, he's leaving because... Why is he leaving going to Moab? No food in Bethlehem. And so they, they're hunting bread. Um, 
Now we see something about his family. Uh, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the wife was named Naomi, and she had they had two sons. Uh, Malon was the name of one, and Kilion was the name of the other. And they are all identified as Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Ephra, or Ephrath, rather, uh, was an old name for Bethlehem. And so that just identifies them of the, of the tribe of Judah, but they were from Bethlehem. Ephra, uh, Ephrath uh, was uh, the old name for, Be- uh, for Bethlehem. That's a, just identifying where they were from. And they went to the country of Moab, and, and they remained there. So verse 3 says that uh, Elimelech died, and she was left, and the two sons. Now what did the two sons do? They took wives, and one of them uh, married uh, Orpah, and the other married Ruth. And they stayed for how long? Ten years. And then the text ends, Verse uh, that section of the text ends, that both of the sons, Malon and Kilion, also died. And so the woman uh, survived her two sons and her husband. And you think, here's a woman that goes off with her entire family, her husband and her two sons, and now she's she's got daughter-in-laws that we're going to focus upon, but uh, she's they're all three gone. J. Sidlow Baxter says they, they were seeking bread, but they found graves, is what he sees in chapter 1. They went to a land looking for bread, but they went there and they found grave sites, is what they found. Things don't always turn out like you plan. That's one of the things we're going to learn in this. Things don't always go as we think. Uh, uh, things are not always maybe as bad as we think. Watch for those practical things as we go along. We'll try to pull that out for the end. All right, let's talk about 6 to 18 now. What happens in 6 to 18? Let's focus on 6 to 13. Ten years have passed, and so she decides she's better go back to Bethlehem. And notice the, the wording of this at verse 6, that she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Notice the wording of that. She didn't just, the text doesn't just say she heard that things are getting better, the famine is, is improved, things are getting better, there's bread there. They have crops that are growing. But the wording of it is, she heard that the Lord had visited, the footnote will say in the New King James, attended to his people. But the Lord, she heard, the Lord is taking care of his people. Is what she'd heard. Lord's taking care of his people and giving them bread. And so she's ready to go back home. Um, Now, I want to follow that attitude just a little bit. Um, the wording of verse 6, and you're welcome to take issue with this, um, seems to be that that's saying that was her attitude, not that the writer, whoever that is, we don't know, is saying the Lord had visited his people and she had heard about that. But it seems to me that it's wording that that was her attitude, that she had heard the Lord had visited his people. And I want to trace that attitude because we're going to see a little bit of a different attitude of hers at chapter 113, 1 verse, 20, ver, uh, 1 verse 21, and then a shift backwards a little bit later in chapter 2 and verse 20. Uh, we'll trace some of those attitudes here in just a moment. But just, just focus on that and stick that in the back of your mind. Now beginning at verse 7, then she went out and so she tells her daughter-in-laws that she's going to return to the land of Judah. And what does she say to them? Verse 8 and 9. Yes, your chances of having a, uh, finding a mate and your chances of having a family and your chances of getting married are far better in your country here in Moab than going back with me to the land of uh, Judah, Bethlehem. That's far better. That's the, basically the wording. Um, so she says at verse 8, go return to each one to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. 
Her attitude toward her daughter-in-laws was, you finish my sentence. You were good to my sons and me. And I hope the Lord deals as kindly with you as you have dealt with me. That's what she's saying. You've been good to my sons and to me. So you've dealt good with those who have passed on. And the Lord grant that you may find rest in the house of your husband. That is, and so she kissed them and left them, and they all wept because of their love one for another. Now, beginning at verse 10, what does she say? We're going down to verse 13, 10 to 13. They said, they both said, no, we're, not, we're, we're going to go with you. But she reasoned with them. This is interesting, 11, 12, and 13. Why do you want to go with me? What does she say? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't have any more sons. I'm too old to get married and have more sons. But even if I could and a child were born, are you going to wait till they're born and, uh, and, or until they're raised and old enough to get married and then you're going to marry them and you're going to wait for them? No, that ain't going to work. And so she says, no, my daughters, it grieves me very much for your sake. And now notice her attitude here, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Stick that in the back of your mind. And before we make much comment, who does that remind you of? An Old Testament character that suffered and yet seemed to lash out. Job, yeah. And there's one thing Job said to his friends uh, in the midst. Maybe we need to, to cut her a little bit of slack here. What did Job say? To, and I'm, uh, I'm paraphrasing here. What was it Job said to his friends? I'll start the sentence and you finish it. He, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. That you ought to understand that when people like me are suffering, we often say things we don't really mean. Or we say things that we later regret. You remember Job saying that? Uh, don't you understand people in my condition suffering like this that sometimes uh, you don't have to correct everything I say because sometimes when you suffer you say things that you, you may not say otherwise when you're not suffering like this. And maybe that's the case here. Uh, I, I, I'm going to throw that open more for discussion when we get to verse 21 and 22. Uh, but just stick that in the back of your mind. But remember her attitude over at verse 6. And that makes me think that at, at one point she has this attitude and then maybe because of suffering, her attitude dips and then it seems to come back again a little bit later. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now let's begin at verse 14 or verse 14 alone. What happens at verse 14? Yeah, she was convinced by her mother-in-law's Words and thought, yeah, that's what I need to do. And so she left and she kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now, beginning at 15 to 18, this is the most quoted section of the book of Ruth. Most often quoted in a marriage ceremony. Is that appropriate? Yeah, it's appropriate. Is it talking about a marriage? No, it's not talking about a marriage. It's talking about a relationship between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. But would it, would the same kind of concept fit with a husband and wife? Well, certainly so, because that's even a closer relationship. So let's get the picture 15 to 18. She clung to her mother-in-law, the text says, uh, and uh, she um, said, or, or Naomi said, look, your, your sister-in-law has gone back uh, to her people. Now let's look at, look at this. And to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Risby outlines it, as we noted earlier, uh, Naomi's bad counsel. Do you think she's giving good advice at verse 15? Naomi is an Israelite. She's not a, she's not a pagan. And she's telling women who'd come out of a pagan society... What you need to do is go back to your country, to your people, and your gods. Good advice? Yeah. 
Yes. Absolutely. And, and, and perhaps I, I'm, I'm wondering, though the text doesn't tell us that she's thinking, if you go back with me, you're not really supposed to marry any, any of our people. You're not supposed to. That's not supposed to happen. I don't know about that because I can't prove that by the text. But it's interesting that she said, go back to your gods. Uh, the pagans served and worshiped gods even by child sacrifice. And uh, that means I want you to go back and I want you to serve your gods. Doesn't seem like good advice, though there may be a good motive why she uh, is saying that I don't want you to go back with me. But Ruth said, and here's our, our most quoted section, entreat me not to leave you nor to return back from following after you. In other words, paraphrasing, quit begging me to, to go elsewhere and leave and to go away from you. For wherever you go, I'll go, and where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. In other words, Ruth wants to serve the God of heaven. I want your God to be my God, and where you die, I die, and where you'll be buried, I'll bury. The Lord do so also more, uh, do to me also, uh, more also, if anything but death parts between me and you. I'm going to stick with you till I die. And so here is devotion. Uh, that and no wonder we 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 quote that in uh, more in times of marriage in the modern day than we do in a relationship between a a uh, in law, uh, but that's how it was used here. Now to finish that section, verse eighteen. What was Naomi's reaction to that? Ruth came on strong enough about that that Naomi basically the text didn't say what she said, but it is basically said. Well, okay, then I'm going to quit. It says he quit speaking to her. It doesn't mean she quit talking to her. She quit speaking to her in this fashion of trying to keep her to uh, get her to stay. So let's get 19 to 21 now in interest of time. Let's move on because I want to get to chapter 2. Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem. What happens when they come back into the city? She comes marching back into Bethlehem. The word is... She's come back and the people are glad to see her. And they start hollering, hollering, hollering her name. And they say, Naomi. And what does she say? Don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara. Don't call me pleasant, Naomi is what that means. But call me Mara, which means bitter. Why did she want to be called bitter? She says, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Now remember the attitude we looked at at verse 13? The hand of the Lord has gone out against me, she said. She said, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Look at verse 21. I went out full. In other words, I went, I went off to this land with my husband and two sons. And the Lord has brought me back again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. I don't find any evidence in the text that justifies her attitude. And if you found it, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm not putting that out as a challenge. And then as soon as you mention, I've, I've got something I'm going to come back with and <laughs> hammer that down. I'm just saying, I, I hadn't seen it. Maybe you have. Job in chapter 3, I see nothing in the text that justifies that attitude of chapter 3. In fact, from about chapter 28 on, indicates that he was wrong in that attitude. There's nothing seems to justify that attitude. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me. One, one, one writer suggested at this juncture, she's overlooking the fact and doesn't know the value that Ruth is bringing with her. And we'll save that for a practical thing here in a moment. So let's get verse 22 and end that section. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, they returned to the country, from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This would have been about April. Uh, so about this time of the year is when they came back as the beginning of the barley harvest, the text says. 
So basically, they stay in Moab and then they come back. That's what this is about. This does have to do with the affliction of Abimelech's family. Questions or comments on chapter 1? Question number 6. Um, what was Naomi's attitude? 113, 120. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Job uh, used the terminology, God set me, and I, this is a paraphrase, God set me up for target practice. In other words, God's shooting arrows at me. And I feel like God's just shooting at me, and I'm, he's just using me for target practice, and I'm just getting shot up here. Um, and there's no indication that was justified. Question number five, what was the family relationship between Naomi and Ruth? Mary the law and daughter-in-law. Chapter two now. Ruth gathers in the field of Boaz. Chapter two. Who is Boaz? Question seven. Yeah, he was a near kinsman to Elimelech. He was a wealthy kinsman. The text indicates. Now, let's work through chapter uh, 2 here, and then we'll have some time for some practical stuff, hopefully to drive home. Uh, Ruth goes into the fields to gather what's left. Let's get that verses 1 to 3 before we go any further. Uh, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a man of great wealth, the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So verse 2 and 3, what happens here in 2 and 3? What does Ruth do? Yeah, they went there for bread. That's why they. That's why they went there in the first place. And so let me. Uh, and the husbands are dead. They're gone. Uh, and so uh, Naomi is getting old. So let me go out and gather uh, the wheat, and let me go out and gather in the crop. So she does, and she. They work in the field. She ends up working in a field, a part of the field that belongs to um, to Boaz, the family of Elimelech. Now, beginning at verse four through seven. Boaz comes along and he wants to know who she is. As he comes in uh, from Bethlehem, he comes to the field and asks, uh, uh, who is this woman, verse 6? And their answer to that, verse 6 and 7, was, what did they say about her? Yeah. And he would know Naomi because of the kin, near kinship. Uh, she came back. You know, remember Naomi had been gone, so he come back from Moab, and here she brings this uh, woman with her. And they talked about how she had uh, continued. Um, da, 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 let me see what I'm looking for. Um, and she asked, please let me gather the grain after the reapers uh, among the sheaves. And so she came and has continued working until now. In other words, she's a hard worker. She's been out here all day, except for the little rest that she took. Other than that, she's been out here working, and she asked if she could work behind the reapers. She didn't want to get out there in the middle of the reapers, but what's left? And, and the, that was for where the poor picked up, and, and uh, according to Leviticus 19, the poor could do that. They come along after the reapers have gathered the crop, and she gathers what may be left out there. And so that's who she is. Now let's go to beginning in verse 18. Boaz told Ruth to reap grain with the other reapers. In other words, come on up here, and uh, and uh, there's some others that are here, and I want you to, to go with them. Look at beginning at verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, you will you know, listen to me. Do not glean in another field. In other words, there were different fields, and she had gleaned perhaps in one field and then another, and then she comes to Boaz's field. Don't go to any other field. I want you to reap, uh, reap in my field close to my young women that are working there. Verse 9, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. And I... Uh, and I, have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when they drink from the vessels that are providing water for them, you drink from that as well. What else do you see down through verse 13? She responded, verse 10. She's kind of impressed and, in fact, amazed. Why? 
Why have you done this to me, shown such kindness, when I am a foreigner? I'm from Moab. I'm not among the Israelites. And this is interesting, verse verse 12. You might mark verse, verse 12. What do you see? I'm sorry? Absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Look at verse 11. Uh, it has been reported all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother and your land and to come and, and to take care of your mother-in-law. I, I, I've heard all that story. I've heard all the story about how good you've been, how you blessed her. And so that's what I'm willing to do. And so notice that he's not saying, I want to repay you. I want to be good to you. But the Lord repay you a full reward be given by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you've come for refuge. Verse 12 is an interesting verse because uh, Boaz pictures the Lord as a picture of refuge, but why have I been good to you? Because the Lord is going to repay you for your goodness and God's going to bless you because of your good service to your mother-in-law. The Lord's blessing you. I'm seeing providence of God in this context. Now let's start at verse 14 now. And 14 to 16, what happens? He has her to eat with the other workers. And uh, in other words, she can eat of their meals. And then he goes and tells the men who are, who are reaping that he's gathering in the crop, not the people that are gathering up the scraps left over, but the ones that are reaping. Leave her some. Purposely drop some along the way so she gets plenty. And I want to make sure we take care of her. And so... Uh, Notice the word at verse 16, that let some bundles fall purposely for her and leave it, that she may glean and do not rebuke her. And so she gleaned in the field. And what she gathered for that day was about an ephah of barley. That's about 20, nearly 21 quarts uh, for reference. Uh, on that, this is from Bible manna, an ephah equaled about 20.9 quarts or 22.9 liters. Um, and so that's, that's a lot. She about 20 quarts. Uh, 21 quarts, nearly, uh, is what she gathered. Now, beginning at uh, at verse 17, she goes and she tells Naomi, verse 17 to 23 now, let's finish that section and wind up with some practical things here. Um, she took that to her mother-in-law, and what was the reaction of Naomi? Yeah, that... Um, where have you gleaned today? Where, where were you going? And um, I lost my place. Verse 19. Blessed is the one who took notice of you and she told her mother-in-law the where she had worked and the name's, man's name was Bo, uh, Boaz. Now verse 21, this is, seems to be a change of attitude. What I, I want to picture this for you that we, her, let me go back to chapter 1. Her attitude was the Lord has visited his people. Chapter 1 verse 6. Then she said, the Lord has been against me, 113. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me, verse 20. She, The Lord has afflicted me, verse 21. But now what is her attitude, verse 20 of chapter 2? Yeah. Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken the kindness to the living and the dead. In other words, the Lord's been good to us. The Lord's blessed us. Uh, seems to be a change in her attitude, and she mentions this was a, a relative of ours. Um, what else do you see down through verse 23 before we go to another point? Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, verse 22, it is good, my daughter, uh, that you go out with the young women and that the people not do not meet with you in another field. Um, I take it that because of, and perhaps that's because of an invading armies, uh, the time of the judges and the time of oppression, uh, that that may be what's going on here. Um, that it's not, I'm, I'm gathering, and there is some conjecture here, so 
accept it or reject it for what it's worth, that it's dangerous for you to go out another field. Stay in the field of Boaz, and he will bless you. He will take care of you, and the Lord is repaying us here. And so she stayed by the close by the women and stayed through the harvest. She had mentioned that Boaz had told her, as long as I'm harvesting, you just keep working right here until the harvest is all taken in. And so you gather whatever you need. All right, questions or comments on chapters 1 and 2? Chapter 1 was they stay in Moab and they return back to Bethlehem. And then when they get there, she gathers in the field of Boaz and is winning favor with Boaz. And then we're going to go from there in chapters 3 and 4. Go to question number 9 in the time we have left. The practical things that you learn from chapters 1 and 2. Something you take home with you. But the spiritual may be going south. That's a good point. Good point. Real good. What else? Character absolutely matters. Good point. What else? Yeah, it seemed like her, her attitude kind of goes in a cycle. And I'm willing to cut her some slack in the sense that she's suffering because Job lashed out, and yet he was a man of integrity and a man of faith. And uh, who knows, if I suffer like Naomi and Job did, I might lash out too. Didn't mean I should, it just means I might. comes back so, to, yeah. You know, I don't know, like I say, it doesn't really say that they did the wrong thing by going to Moab, but, you know, they left the, the land of bread to seek bread. That's a good point. Very good. Good analogy. Last one on the screen is one of the more important ones. When you think things are bitter, I don't mean more important than what we've heard, but the more important ones I've got. When you think things are bitter, as Naomi it may be that there's a hidden blessing. She thinks things are bitter, but she brought Ruth back. Ruth's very important. She didn't see that at this juncture. Don't mean she didn't think that Naomi, I mean that Ruth was important, but she doesn't really realize how important Ruth is going to be. And she's going to be part of that lineage of the, of the Lord. And she doesn't see that. And has no way of knowing that. And it may be that when I think things have really turned bitter and the Lord is against me and the Lord is shooting arrows at me, that there may be a hidden blessing back here that I may never see. I may never see that blessing of something that's coming along with me, but I don't even have a clue it's there. And it may be part of that same kind of story. We'll stop there and finish with chapters 3 and 4 next time.